this video, I'm going to attempt to explore the topic of freedom. And freedom is often, well, it's a word that, like so many words, it's a word we use very frequently. But I think um, precisely because we use the word so frequently and because it's so common to us, um, that also means that we often don't, we often don't think twice about it. And in some ways, that's what I've tried to um, set forth as, in some ways, the spirit or essence of critical thinking which is uh, sort of to take a second look at something that seems familiar, um, to think twice about something that we already think we, that we've thought through. And so uh, that's kind of the, the motivation and the spirit behind today's lecture, um, specifically with respect to the concept of freedom. Um, immediately with the concept of freedom, we will, uh, we will probably associate that concept with free will. And I would like to, just at the outset of this lecture, kind of um, disambiguate those terms and, and in fact, uh, sort of show why why free will uh, can be a very misleading um, a misleading name for something, and the reason for that is because um, when when we think about uh, well when we think about free will we can't think about that freedom of the will we can't think about that separate uh, from thinking itself. In other words, uh, free will in some ways um, in some ways it, it always implies freedom of thinking. The reason for this is because um, if I decide to do something as though through free will, um, that decision itself, uh, the kind of the origin, the departure point for whatever action that I'm going to take, uh, that the departure point always originated in thinking. Um, if I if I try to imagine a, so, a sort of free will, an action, uh, but but an action that didn't originate in thinking, it's kind of a contradiction in terms, and it would no longer be free. Um, there are a thousand things that I do every day, um, a thousand actions that I take every day that I don't think about. And it, it's hard to call those free in the sense that, um, just for example, uh, uh, taking my next breath or blinking my eyes, right, or growing my fingernails, etc. These are not exactly, I mean, these are biological processes. I don't really have any, any part in them um, insofar as, uh, insofar as they, they originate from a free decision. So for that, that's the reason that I, um, kind of at the outset, I wish to differentiate those two terms and just show how um, free will it will always lead back to the question of, of free thinking. Um, in some ways, freedom of the will, um, the reason that I said that can be a misleading term is it's almost as though um, freedom uh, is not, it's, it's as though it's not pertinent to the, the concept of, of, of the will. Um, it might be like, it might be analogous to an asking a question um, such as, um, such as, uh, what is the what is what color is the square root of three? Um, that's obviously a, a question that doesn't really have an answer, and, and the reason it doesn't have an answer is because um, is because those terms, uh, color and and the square root of three, they don't really um, they don't really meet one another. Yeah. And so, in a similar way, freedom and will by itself, without thinking. Um, in some ways, those are very similar in, in the sense that uh, it might be a misapplication of the, the idea of freedom to think about it in respect to the will, um, separate from thinking. Uh, that being said, uh, an action that originates in thinking, um, this, is, this is kind of the real, now we're getting to, in some ways, the pith and marrow of this question today, which is, is it possible to have a, an action that originates in pure thinking? And that might seem like a very obvious answer, and in, in some way it is. It's a, a kind of, it might seem like an immediate experience we have. But I want to take some time to, again, in the spirit of critical thinking, um, reflect on whether it's so straightforward as it might seem. And in fact, uh, experts in many scientific fields would, um, almost without hesitation, uh, kind of uh, dis re reject the notion that we could have, uh, that, that freedom that we could have freedom, that uh, we could act out of freedom, that we could think in freedom, um, and for there's a number of uh, there's a number of different uh, sort of arguments against freedom, in fact, and in, uh, there there are very many, and many of them are quite compelling, and those arguments uh, it's not merely from a single field of science, for example, it's uh, many fields of science seem to converge on the conclusion that that in fact the freedom that we think we enjoy is uh, somehow some sort of illusion. In other words, uh, we have the belief that we're free, but that the belief is uh, in some ways a mistake. Um, I'll try to explain what I mean by taking just a number of examples from 
from a variety of, of fields uh, of science. And just to uh, kind of give a cursory, a cursory arguments for why we might um, seriously call into, into question uh, the, 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 the proposition that we might in fact uh, possess freedom as, as individuals. Um, in, in some ways, one of the most basic arguments against freedom, in fact, uh, comes from uh, just basic physics. And, um, you know, especially uh, since the, over the last hundred years or so, the beginning of the, um, the first several decades of the 20th century, with these, uh, you know, revolutionary findings in, in quantum mechanics, um, physicists have been able, with, uh, with amazing statistical accuracy, to uh, basically calculate what's called the wave function of any given uh, subatomic particle. And what that means, basically, is that um, from any state of initial condition, a physicist could, uh, ha uh, a physicist with access to the requisite, uh, you know, information, again, in respect to initial condition, can basically predict what any particle is going to do next. And that's called the evolution of the wave function. So it's a, a sort of equation. But the equation provides for the, um, the prediction with, with immense accuracy of what any physical particle will do uh, through, as it moves through time. And that, that's uh, the topic of the, or the phrase, the term evolution. That's what it means in the context of physics. Uh, it's the kind of um, the movement through time of, of a, given, a, a given function. And um, in some ways, the, in the implications of this, um, you, might, you might think like, well, of course, particles don't have freedom. But, um, but then uh, to think a little bit further about that, it should, be, should become clear that, um, you know, well, let's just take a sort of, uh, uh, you know, particles are so uh, subatomic, they're so microscopic. We could take a slightly um, more manageable example and, and just imagine like if, if, I, uh, if I pushed a nickel across the desk, um, it would be, it would seem silly to ask the nickel, uh, supposing the nickel could, could respond to us. Um, you know, were you free to move across the desk at, a, at precisely that moment? Um, and it, it would seem like a mis, misapplication of concepts again. Um, the nickel, it's not as though it's free, free or not. Um, then, but, but then, and, and so we might again be able to sort of uh, rest easy knowing that the nickel's not free, but, but in fact we are. At the same time though, you have to, uh, we have to take into account that, that our, own, our own bodies and our own brains are made of just exactly those same particles, those same kind of particles that uh, are, uh, you know, constituting the nickel, for example. In other words, um, all inanimate objects are made of exactly the self-same uh, physical particles that, uh, that we ourselves uh, are made of. And so immediately this, this can sort of uh, cast a shadow of doubt over our confidence in the, the, the um, you know, the concept, the confidence in our capacity for freedom because we would begin to think, um, you know, if all of those particles follow basically determined, predetermined um, evolution through, uh, you know, which can be calculated by the wave function, um, we're made of those same particles, our own bodies. Uh, we imagine that we can make decisions and do one thing after the next. But in fact, in some way, those decisions are already, this isn't, a pr uh, this isn't really the precise term, but, but in some ways they're pre-programmed or they're pre-ordained in some way. Because again, those particles are just following, they're following physical laws in a deterministic way. So it's very difficult to uh, s suddenly, uh, this seemingly straightforward idea of like, um, well, uh, you know, each of us is possessed of the capacity to, to um, you know, freely, freely make decisions, freely choose our actions. Um, suddenly it's uh, much more problematic. And this is only having considered one argument in respect to physics. We can even think of um, you know, we can, we can take it in a, in a different, from a different domain of science, something of a different, a different scale, certain, certainly a different set of theories. And we can consider this question in respect to, to biology. And um, again, we will immediately encounter many, perhaps surprising, uh, but, but we will encounter many obstacles uh, to a, a sort of a straightforward conclusion that, that in fact we are possessed of this capacity for freedom. Um, one, one very immediate obstacle that we will encounter is uh, sort of within the, within the domain of biology, the kind of sub, uh, subcategory of neurology. And if we just picture, um, if we just uh, kind of uh, take a moment to recognize that our, 
our brains are, um, you know, they're made as a, a sort of uh, synthesis of, uh, you know, a million different neurons. Um, those neurons can be studied just like any other, uh, you know, physical or, or biological object. And in fact, they have been. And in, uh, it's, it's becoming increasingly, um, they're increasingly susceptible to being studied because of advances in technology, um, modern advances in technology. But, but already, um, this is now uh, close to 40 years ago in the, in the early 80s, there was a famous uh, psychologist or neurologist called Benjamin Libet. And he was able to perform experiments on, a, uh, on uh, various subjects um, by sort of linking their brain up to, uh, I believe they didn't have functional magnetic res uh, resonance imagery back then, but it was electrocephalocardiogram, I think they're called the EKG, -E -E ECG, ECG maybe is the acronym. And uh, Benjamin Libet was actually able to show uh, if, if two subjects were given, uh, for example, given a choice between between um, pushing a red button and pushing a green button, and they were uh, ostensibly given the free choice to choose between those two. Um, Benjamin Libet was actually able to, by monitoring their brains, he was able to predict which uh, button these subjects would push um, a number of seconds before they themselves became aware or conscious of the fact that they were making the decision. Um, this again bodes, it bodes ill for, for our, uh, our confidence in free will or freedom, because uh, precisely because, because um, in some way, to put it, uh, to put it kind of pithily, our, uh, it would appear that our brains are making decisions before that we are. Um, and we might think, well, um, I am my brain. Uh, but the problem with that is, uh, if that's true, then we will have to uh, throw free will out, for, or the concept of freedom, the, the hope, the confidence in freedom. We'll have to uh, discard that for good because um, I think just a moment's reflection w will reveal that uh, we have no idea really what's going on in our brains when we think something, when we experience something. Um, when, I, when I wish to perform a free action, I have no, um, you know, no awareness uh, in respect to the sort of neurophysical correlates in my brain that correspond to whatever decision that I'm making. Um, if I was going to be, if I was truly going to be free, this would be a kind of uh, necessary condition for that, that freedom. Um, if, if I was going to be free and also if uh, uh, you know, my brain was the basis of that freedom, it would be a necessary condition for me to have some sort of awareness of what is going on in my brain, uh, precisely because of the fact that I don't. Um, then if we assume that, that our brains are the basis for, for freedom and, and thought and decision making, then again, uh, this, uh, it's not a very optimistic outlook to uh, salvage the concept of freedom from the advances of, of scientific discovery. So um, just as a sort of recapitulation, um, I, I have no, no idea of what's going on in my brain at the level at which those brain processes occur. It's, um, by the same token, I'm, uh, it's, it's been kind of demonstrated that uh, the thoughts that I have, uh, they do have some sort of, um, they do have a sort of uh, correlate or correspondence to activity in my brain. And so when I say I don't have any idea what's going on in my brain, what I mean specifically is I don't have any idea of what's going on in my brain at the level at which those brain processes are occurring. I do have an uh, immediate idea. And in fact, that's kind of the basis of, of ideation itself. I do have an immediate idea of what is going on in my thoughts. Uh, so I, I, I'm aware and conscious of my thoughts. I'm uh, unconscious in respect to what's going on in my brain. There's a relationship between those two, but my uh, awareness and consciousness is uh, squarely positioned in the first one. In other words, in, in respect to thinking and, and ideation. Um, there's another, uh, you know, even with just within the, the scope of biology, there's, um, we can even think in terms of, and so I've, I've showed, you know, I've kind of, uh, brought forth an example from, from uh, basic neurology to, uh, again, kind of suggest a difficulty with a naive concept of freedom. There's another, um, we can even think just in purely chemical terms, though, and this will, will in this respect, will come up with a very similar difficulty, uh, a, sim a difficulty that's very similar to the one that we encountered in physics. 
which is um, chemical processes, they obviously just uh, seem to occur in some way without any kind of, um, you know, deliberate or intentional, um, intentional movement on our own part. Um, you know, one, one, one chemical process just follows the next. It's not at all obvious. And in fact, it's quite a mystery how, um, again, uh, something, something that's obviously spatial, like those chemical processes in a, in a brain or the, or the uh, neurons and neurological processes that constitute the brain as a kind of spatial object. Um, it's, a, it's kind of incomprehensible mystery almost if we assume that, that truly the brain is the basis for freedom. And the, the brain is the basis for, I mean, it, it probably can't be the basis for freedom for this reason, that if we assume that it's the basis for um, thinking and, and experience and consciousness, um, it's not at all clear how, and in fact, it's, a, it's an immense mystery, how um, we, could, um, we could even know that, right? Because again, the, the brain is, is very, very obviously a, a spatial object. It's a body in space. Um, I couldn't do this at the same time that I'm talking, uh, most likely, but, but you know, uh, feasibly, a person could, could take his, uh, a person's brain could be removed and the brain could be uh, in front of the person, so to speak. Um, that's, it's, I, I just mean to illustrate by that, that uh, the brain is, uh, it's again, something with spatial boundaries. It has a clear shape. Um, if we think of sh shape and uh, spatiality, um, when I said that, that, that color is not applicable to, uh, to a number or an equation, um, uh, um, in, in respect to the brain, um, it's very clear that um, shape and spatiality is, in fact, pertinent to the concept of a brain. By the same token, what's uh, shape and spatiality is, uh, it's not pertinent to a concept like, like freedom itself. Um, freedom doesn't, uh, it doesn't have a shape it doesn't have a color. It doesn't. Have, so there, there are all of these physical, these these uh, qualities or characteristics that are pertinent to physical objects, and um, they're distinctly not pertinent to a concept like freedom, and many other concepts as well. The reason that that's a problem is because it's not clear how how we would um, how we would get from, again, a spatial object like a brain, which is very clearly bounded in space, um, to uh, to freedom. And it would be, uh, I, I tried to indicate at the outset that it has to be um, by way of thinking. This is maybe a stretch of, a, of an analogy, but, but imagine a, a horse and a cart. Um, and then there's a driver in the cart. And it's like I said about, uh, it's a misapplication of, of, of freedom to apply it to the will. If we think of uh, kind of like how the cart moves and where the cart moves, um, we don't really question whether the cart is, is free to move, except in respect to very rudimentary mechanical processes, like if one of its axles is broken, then obviously the cart isn't going to move. But supposing it's a, it's, it is a cart and it's not a broken cart, um, we, we still wouldn't really think about freedom in respect to the cart. Because, uh, because again, freedom it really has no place in respect to just purely mechanical processes or objects. We would think about freedom in respect to the driver of the cart. And, and so we have, uh, again, I'm trying to set up an analogy here. Um, imagine uh, the cart is, uh, again, like a physical object, um, like the brain, for instance. And then you have a driver of the cart. And, and I, uh, I said, it's not clear how you get from, from a, uh, a mechanical process, a physical process, like, like the cart, uh, to something. Uh, and it, this analogy, again, it's giving a, the analogy is giving a spatial, it's giving pictorial form to something that is I'm trying to illustrate that, in fact, freedom is fundamentally not, uh, not spatial. Uh, but I'm just putting that on the side for a moment to make use of this analogy, um, pretending as though freedom were a spatial object. It would be represented by the driver in this case. And imagine uh, what connects the driver to the, to the, the cart. Uh, another better way of saying that is what connects, the, what relates the, drivers in, uh, the driver to the, um, the direction that the cart takes, the movement of the cart are the, uh, you know, the reins that pull on the horse, for example. So the driver has the reins in his hands, uh, and pulling on the reins. This could be thought of as um, thinking. In other words, what relates freedom to a uh, to, uh, mechanical object, like the brain, is thinking. Yeah. And that being said, um, it's very clear that um, we can think about 
physical objects. But physical objects themselves aren't about anything. And in, in some ways, again, so, so thinking kind of, uh, it's what opens us up to this mystery in the first place. It's very obvious that, um, again, like I mentioned at the outset, the question of freedom, it would never arise for something that was purely mechanical or purely physical. Because again, freedom is, is it's, it's not a physical concept in the first place. And so in, in some sense, it's, it's inescapable if we want to truly confront this question. The, the place we have to confront it is within our own thinking and our own consciousness and our own questioning, really. Um, you know, if we lack the capacity to question and to think, this, uh, this would never, this difficult, these difficulties would never arise in the first place. And you might say, um, well, that means they are in some ways, uh, you know, specious or factitious, like maybe they shouldn't arise. But um, that's, it's kind of nonsense because in order to say that, a person would be making use of the same kind of thinking that he or she is ostensibly, you know, discounting or rejecting with that statement. Um, and so I only say that just to, uh, just to motivate uh, continuing exploration of this question and so we don't just table it because of a, well, because of a, a, a misplaced objection. Um, returning to the, again, the sort of uh, domain of biology, there's even more reasons to be skeptical of freedom. Um, another one of these, uh, for, for instance, is, is the, the, the kind of, um, you know, the, the, the theory and, and, and understanding of, of Darwinian evolution. Um, if we, to accept the theory of Darwinian evolution, it would entail that, um, <coughs> excuse me, it would entail that our, basically everything about us, including our brains, um, are the, the, the product of, um, of, uh, of the process of, of natural selection um, over time. And, uh, and that, that entails that, um, you know, it's uh, a given individual and, and species, a species evolved because of uh, the, the, um, the sort of survival utility or genetic fitness of the individuals that comprise that species. And so um, basically the, the implication of, of the theory of, of Darwinian evolution would be that um, everything we, we discover today um, has an explanation in, in terms of, uh, purely in terms of uh, survival utility that, that it conferred on our forebears, on our ancestors. Um, the implication of this would be that our, our brains and, um, and a kind of a, a basic postulate or tenet of, of, uh, of Darwinian theory is that um, it, it doesn't really leave a place for, for uh, mind or thinking outside of, the, uh, outside of uh, the brain or outside of purely uh, processes that are geared toward survival utility. And so we're mostly talking about the brain, but kind of uh, meaning also to include our minds and our experiences um, from the Darwinian paradigm. So uh, from within this Darwinian paradigm, again, freedom, we would, uh, it would have to be really, I mean, seriously scrutinized and, scrutinized and probably uh, rejected. Because, because if we really uh, follow out this theory with its implications, we will realize that that everything that we discover about ourselves and all of our capacities today, they are purely, um, they are purely purposed toward um, survival and propagation of our genetic, genetic material. Um, it's not at all, it's not at all clear that, um, it's, so again, this sort of, it becomes so tight and so claustrophobic that there's no space left for freedom. Now, what I mean by this is um, all of our instincts are uh, included within this uh, this general rubric of, of survival utility, um, and it, you know from from that perspective, we would have to just assume that that every every time that I think I'm making a, de a decision, that in fact uh, what's really going on is that I'm uh, playing out my uh, my inheritance, you know, uh, that's come down to me through my four through my, I mean, almost by definition they were successful uh, just because I exist, but my ancestors who have basically conferred on me all of these, these predispositions and, and instincts. And so uh, when I, again, there's, there's, no, there's no space left for kind of free, free decision or free thinking or free action. Uh, because again, any free action or free decision would have to be subsumed within that general theory and general paradigm of, of uh, you know, propagation and, and uh, descent of species. Um, there's a very um, expressive 
uh, one of the most expressive uh, proponents of, of uh, the sort of Darwinian paradigm to understand uh, nature and, and, and ourselves is a um, thinker called Richard Dawkins. And he describes, uh, you know, Darwinian, he describes this process. He says the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the ex explanation for the existence and apparently, purpose, apparently purposeful form of life. So again, purpose appears to, uh, uh, um, you know, our actions appear to have purpose, but in fact, uh, they have no purpose. Um, he, says, uh, he says, again, uh, this Darwinian process has no purpose in mind. It has no mind at all and no mind's eye at all. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. And now again, um, you know, from, from this picture, if we imagine something with no, again, no vision, no foresight, no sight at all, uh, there's just no space for freedom. Um, we, you know, in freedom, by, by freedom and, and, and making a free decision, um, you know, for, for a reason that, that it's my own reason, uh, it kind of, it implicates force, uh, foresight or, or vision in, its, uh, in, in the same way that, um, you know, uh, a, um, a physical object implicates a spatial dimension in the same way. So, so in just the same, with just the same necessity, freedom implicates the ability to, um, you know, have a prospect into the future. And again, uh, Dawkins is just uh, very eloquently expressing the, the view of, of uh, from the Darwinian paradigm, which uh, leaves no, no room for that. And so I've, uh, you know, I've, I've listed a number of, kind of aired a number of grievances against the concept of freedom from, from various domains of science, from, from physics, from, from neuroscience, from biology. Um, we can even uh, move on now to, to psychology. And it's a little bit, it's, it's a different kind of science, but it, you know, it comes to, uh, to uh, it calls freedom into question in, in, in very similar, if not even more compelling ways. Um, one kind of initial, uh, one initial observation to make in respect to freedom and psychology is that um, in a very basic way, uh, you know, we often think of, we often think of freedom as, as uh, um, being able to do do what we want. So I'm free as long as I can do what I want and nobody stops me from the outside. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, uh, just a, a cursory reflection from a, from a psychological standpoint will reveal to me that, um, that I'm uh, not nearly so free as I imagine myself to be. And that in fact, uh, if I merely do what I want, um, in some ways I'm, uh, you know, the person who does, merely does what he wants is in some ways the least free of anyone. Uh, the reason for that, it's somewhat of a striking claim, but, but I think it's actually almost self-evident. It's that, um, it's that in, in, if I don't, if I didn't, um, uh, if I had no say in my wants, if I didn't get to choose my desires, if uh, in some ways the desires, they, they basically just, um, they sort of sprang upon me and indentured me to, uh, to carry them out. Like I basically become their servant and their slave. I'm a slave to my desires as long as I, as long as I'm only doing what I want. And, and that's the reason that I said uh, to do what I want makes me among the least free of all people. Um, and so that might seem like initial, an initial objection to the, the prospect of freedom from psychology and, and just mere introspection as we can immediately become aware that, that uh, we often find ourselves kind of um, in medias res uh, indentured to carrying out some desire. And again, I'm sort of bound to carry out the desire. I don't have any... Uh, kind of uh, subject to that same desire. The desire begins to, um, it, it sort of exerts authority over me. It presides over me. Um, another kind of reflection that psychology can reveal upon introspection is that I, um, I don't really know what I will think next. I'm kind of at the whim of, of whatever thought comes into my mind. Now, in order to be free, I would, um, well, it's like, I, I, it, it's hard to imagine being free if I'm entirely subject to whatever capricious thought comes into my mind next. Again, it's almost as though freedom would cease to make sense, um, if that's the only faculty that I have in respect to my thinking. It's sort of being at the mercy of, of you know, a, just a spontaneous impulse that happens to arise. We can also think in terms of uh, psychology, in terms of kind of, um, you know, analytic psychology or Freudian psychology. And again, this will be very clear that uh, it poses serious difficulties for freedom. Um, Sigmund Freud, around the, you know, roughly 
around the same time as, as these uh, great revolutions in physics at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Sigmund Freud was uh, kind of discovering, uh, you know, comparable, uh, he was, you know, there was a, a comparable evolution, uh, revolution in respect to the, the psychological sciences. And Sigmund Freud, um, and then uh, people that followed him, Adler and, and Jung, et cetera, they were discovering uh, what is now sort of referred to as uh, the unconscious. And the idea is that um, despite that we think we are, um, you know, it's very analogous to the idea of, of our brains making decisions before we are, except that's a kind of physicalistic, that's from a physicalistic paradigm. From a, uh, an, the paradigm of, of depth psychology, we would say something analogous. We would say that, um, that our, our unconscious makes decisions before we do. And, uh, you know, our, our waking consciousness, where we think we have, you know, freedom and autonomy, it's, it's much more uh, like a, almost like an epiphenomenal froth on the sea of our unconscious. And all of the real, real decisions are, are happening in, in, in the depths, so to speak. This, again, it would pose almost insurmountable difficulties to the notion of freedom. Um, there's a great, uh, returning to uh, just the idea that, um, you know, and, and those, those unconscious drives, they would, they would basically, um, they would be dictating our, our desires and our wants. And so these, uh, this relates to the, the first objection that I made from psychology, which is that if we don't choose our desires, um, and yet nevertheless we think that we're free to carry out those same desires, um, in some ways it would seem like we are kind of pulling the wool over our, our own eyes. There's a, there's a philosopher called uh, Arthur Schopenhauer who lived in the, um, the late 19th century. And he has a great way of, 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 of putting this, a very pithy and uh, you know, expressive way of putting this. He says, um, in German, he says, der Mensch kann tun, was er will, er kann aber nicht wollen, was er will. And it's somewhat difficult to translate in English, uh, but, one, but, but because of the, um, the lead up that I've given, I think it will make sense what, what, he, what he means by this. And more or less it would be, um, a, a man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. In other words, a man can do what he wants, a person can do what he wants, but he cannot want what he wants. In other words, he cannot choose his wants. His wants are kind of, again, they sort of spring upon him, or they're thrust upon him, perhaps by his unconscious. So it becomes, again, by now we've, you know, we've gone through um, a, number of, a number of objections from physics. You know, in the most basic sense, it's like we're part of the basic um, you know, physical processes unfolding since the dawn of time or since the Big Bang. Why would we have? Why would we imagine? Again, freedom seems as though it's just um, has no place in that conception. It's just one physical process after the next, and we find ourselves just in the midst of that. Um, from biology, we've uh, you know just kind of uh, just encountered a number of, of similar difficulties. Um, you know, from from uh, just neurological processes in the brain, they seem to take care of themselves. Um, to Darwinian evolution, which again would seem to indicate exactly the opposite of freedom. Rather, we're entirely determined by our um, genetic and instinctual inheritance. Um, in a similar way, psychology would seem to, uh, you know, cast serious doubt over the concept of freedom, uh, because we seem to be conditioned and, if not determined by, um, you know, our basic kind of unconscious impulses, unconscious drives, unconscious desires. Um, there's uh, there's even a kind of, uh, you know, a, a philosophical objection to freedom. Uh, I, I I don't know. If Philosophical is the, the most accurate term, but I, I think I think it will be clear why why I, I, I use that word, and it's because um, in a basic sense we might we might also think that um, you know in one sense I'm not free to just uh, obviously I'm I'm not free to uh, walk into outer space you know, even if I wished to, um, and in a very similar sense I'm uh, kind of I'm constrained in my thinking itself. What I mean by that is. There are certain things that are not possible for me to think. Um, you know, a very kind of typical example would be like a, a round square or, um, or a, or a uh, yeah, like a triangle with four sides is a very uh, kind of basic example. And um, it would seem then that I'm sort of, uh, you know, constrained almost by the grammar of thinking. And I, uh, I couldn't escape it. This is probably enough objections. I think it will be clear that, well, obviously uh, a person could com come up with more than that, but I think I've at least 
painted a picture um, in respect to, well, I think it will no longer come as a surprise when we feel, uh, when it feels as though that, that if we wanted to preserve our confidence and freedom, that we, we would have to um, defend it in some way from all of these objections. And so I hope that I've at least, and I'm confident that I've at least, um, you know, uh, presented enough, a sufficient number of objections that um, that statement will be, will be self-evident. Um, now I'd just uh, like to kind of, um, I suppose this is sort of a turning point because now I will try to, um, try to explore whether it's possible to preserve freedom in the face of all these objections. One thing that should, we, we should uh, sort of initially address is um, what exactly we understand by freedom. And again, um, freedom can't be merely the, the freedom to uh, carry out my desires, uh, precisely because those desires would seem to, um, those would seem in some ways to be precisely what is, what is um, you know, the, the, the kind of principal obstacle to my freedom is just those desires. That might sound confusing, but, but maybe a scene, there's a, there's a great scene from, from one of Homer's works, The Odyssey, and um, it's uh, Odysseus is, is uh, navigating uh, through this strait, and there are the fabled sirens. The sirens are uh, these voices um, that will, they will lure sailors into the water because the voices are so beautiful. They will lure the sailors off of their boats and the sailors drown ultimately. It's the, um, the siren song. The song of the sirens, is, it's so enticing that the sailors can't resist it. And so um, this, is a, this is clearly a, uh, in other words, the, this, uh, when the sailors hear the song, a desire, uh, a desire to uh, find the one who's singing, it becomes, it, it overpowers the sailors. So um, despite any efforts they might have to resist the desire, uh, the desire is, it, it overcomes them. And it's a very uh, expressive scene because Odysseus actually has his, his men tie him to the mast. So this is a very clear, it's a kind of, uh, you know, mythic depiction of the difference between maybe what might seem like freedom and true freedom. It's very obvious that in this case, um, freedom for Odysseus does not mean merely being able to, um, you know, being at the beck and call of his desires. In fact, it means exactly the opposite. It means, um, it doesn't mean being able to do what he wants. It means um, basically being able to refrain from doing what he wants, being tied to the mast, being bound against the desires so that, that the desires so he's sort of impassable before the desires. Yeah. And, and so I think this is an, a, a very, an initial and very important distinction to make in respect to freedom. It's that it can't possibly mean just doing whatever that I want. This is often, um, you know, uh, one reason that freedom can be such a, a difficult concept is because, again, it, it's so familiar to us. And we imagine it often in a political context, which is like, as long as nobody stops me from the outside, as long as I can, um, you know, uh, pursue happiness and nobody uh, gets in the way of, me, of my own pursuit of happiness, then I'm free. But again, this might be overlooking in some ways the, the real, uh, you know, pith and kernel of freedom, which is uh, precisely um, not being forced to uh, pursue my desires. Um, and so, so I think this, uh, once we start to think, once we start to clarify our concept of freedom, then um, increasingly, I think we will be able to, um, if, not, if not address each of these objections um, specifically, I think we'll begin to uh, reestablish a sort of confidence in freedom. I'll explain why you might think like, well, <laughs> if you can't address these objections, then uh, obviously they've been successful and you don't really have any basis with confidence in freedom anymore. Um, I'll try to explain uh, at the end of this lecture why um, I'll try to explain myself and explain why that's not the case so that even if I couldn't address each one of these objections, it's not, it's not as important as it might seem. Um, I do just, uh, and so um, if we, one, one, one thing that I'll note, um, one objection that I will try to address, in other words, is um, the idea about that, you know, that because we, we do, don't encounter um, and in fact, by, by addressing this objection, I will uh, kind of be leading into this, uh, what, I, what, I just, um, what I just suggested, which is, that, uh, which is the reason why I don't think it's necessary to address each of these objections in principle. Um, 
But, but I, I do just want to return to emphasize this point about the difference between something like thinking and something like freedom and the, what seems to be the, the scope of scientific inquiry, which is uh, physical objects um, se uh, seem to be the, the um, again, the scope, of, the scope of scientific inquiry includes physical objects. And um, it also, I mean, it can't, it can't escape including non-physical objects, but those are always um, specifically relations amongst physical objects. That sounds confusing. What I mean by that is, for instance, the law of gravity itself. It's not exactly a physical object, um, but it but it it's, um, it establishes relations, ordered ordered relations amongst physical objects. Yeah. Um, what I just want to emphasize, though, in, in respect to, for for instance, the objections from biology or the objections from physics, is that it's it's hardly a surprise if we don't encounter um, any any evidence for freedom um, from those fields. And the reason that it's not a surprise is because, um, because of the reason that I mentioned. It's that they specifically uh, prescribe um, and, and, and then proscribe from their scope uh, everything that's not a physical object. They prescribe uh, merely a study of physical objects and they uh, proscribe everything from that scope that is not a physical object. We've already established that, that freedom, again, it, it, it doesn't have a shape, it doesn't have a, a color, it doesn't have any any one of these qualities that um, it doesn't have momentum or spin, right? Um, it's not subject to the four fundamental forces of physics. Obviously, it's just a mis it's it's a misapplication of the concept of freedom to try to construe it in physical terms. This is not to say that physical terms. Um, it's not to say that they have no value or they have no application. It's just that they. It's only to say that they have a specific application, and that is in respect to physical objects and subatomic particles. It's very similar to, uh, to we can address the, the biological questions in a very similar way. Um, you know, uh, what we, the way we look will determine what we see. And this has kind of been a, a fundamental theme that we've been trying to, uh, you know, uh, we sowed it in the last uh, a number of lectures ago in respect to the, the question of, of theory and evidence. Yeah. And it's very obvious that what we see as evidence is a function of what theory we're able to entertain. A, a theory is a way of, it's a way of a looking. It's a way of looking. And, uh, and evidence is what we might see through that way of looking. Um, and, and it's very, I, I think it should be clear by now that, that each of these um, scientific disciplines it, itself, it, it represents something like a theory, something like a, and, and we might imagine that um, it's a number of theories together. It's like a, a tapestry of theories or a, a, a raft of theories that we, you know, we float through the river of um, experience with. And uh, the raft, all the theories together, you could call it something like a paradigm. And in fact, that's something of a technical term uh, to refer to just that, this kind of um, you know, uh, synthesis of a number of different theories that, that, that weave together to form a coherent discipline. And so there's a paradigm of, of physics, there's a paradigm of biology, which um, they're, related, they're related to one another, but they're certainly not identical. In the same way, um, psychology, it's, it's certainly related to the, the, the paradigms of, of physics and biology, but it's, it also has a notable differences. Like it's not clear at all how to account for, um, again, the, the substance of something like a, something like a desire. We might say, well, it's, it's, it's dopamine. But again, um, dopamine is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a physical substance and something like a desire, um, it's fundamentally not a physical thing. Certainly it's related to uh, physical things, but it, again, it doesn't have a shape, doesn't have a, a spatial boundary. Yeah. And so um, just like you know, the mind relative to the brain, um, we're talking about two things that are, are related, but, but fundamentally distinct. Again, because the brain has a, a shape and a space, spatial boundary, the mind doesn't. Um, in, in just the same way, a neurotransmitter like dopamine um, you know, you could measure uh, a dop dopamine in a laboratory. Um, you couldn't measure desire in a laboratory uh, except by correlating it to something that is spatial. And so that's basically what I wanted to say is, um, you know, I, I guess to, to sum this up, I've, I hope that I've, uh, um, you know, presented all of these uh, very, um, very compelling and, and, and feasible objections to freedom. But I hope that I've also showed how they can be incorporated into a coherent um, 
a coherent picture or understanding of this question. And so, in, in, in other words, we don't end up <clears throat> like the blind man and the elephant where we just have a kind of, um, you know, like a smorgasbord of different, different aspects to something without an ability to, to relate them coherently to one another. Um, our elephant here, uh, it comes together once we're able to see, once we're able to recognize the relation that stands between, <clears throat> between um, you know, our way of looking and what we're able to see. Another way of saying the same thing between, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Another way of saying the same thing, um, our, our way of looking, uh, what we see is a function of our way of looking. The same, another way of saying that same thing is to say that the answer we receive is a function of the questions we're able to ask. Um, and so I hope that um, in some ways by establishing that relation and recognizing that relation in all of our perception that we're able to reconcile these apparently divergent and even contradictory uh, theories and conclusions. Um, and fundamentally, it's a, it, you know, this is a kind of question that each of us has to, to answer for ourselves. But we have to say, like, you know, in the final measure, what do we trust? Do we trust, um, you know, a theory that tells us that we're not free? Or do we, or do we uh, kind of, um, or do we trust our own experience? And do we, do, we, do we look at freedom as a postulate, like something we don't have to prove because, because any pr proof would almost presuppose it? Um, in other words, is freedom something that we have to prove, or is it something by which we're able to um, prove other things? Um, I, that's probably a good place to end, and it's it, probably good food for thought. And again, what I hope that I've done with, with this lecture is, um, I suppose one way to look at it is, I hope that I've, in some ways, um, you know, uh, tilled, tilled the soil for our discussions and, and planted, planted a number of seeds. And, and then it's a question over the next, the next days and weeks, um, how we can foster those seeds and, and, you know, what will come of them in this field of our, um, <clears throat> this field of our, our topic, our exploration. And so that's probably a good place to stop, but I, um, uh, I won't end before um, wishing everyone the best and uh, bidding Farewell until next time. <clears throat>